Hello everyone, welcome to Sarachandra IAS Academy. So today in this video we are going to discuss about the economy part questions that are asked in the GS3 mains of this year 2022. Okay, UPSC mains 2022, what are the questions that are asked in the economy part with respect to GS3 we are going to discuss. So we are going to just briefly see what are the questions asked and how a answer could be written for those questions. Okay. So the first question that was asked in the GS3 paper is why is private partnership okay public private partnership required in the infrastructural projects and examine the role of PPP model in redevelopment of railway stations in India. So First of all, we need to understand why this question was asked in this year means. So whenever, especially with respect to the questions in polity and economy, if you can understand the context, why that question was asked, and you can write that context in the introduction only, that will fetch you extra marks. Because first you need to understand that why UPSC is asking this question in the exam. So we are going to look at the context of the question, why it is in news. Similarly, from which part of the syllabus this question was asked and deconstruction the question, what should be the introduction and parts of the question and finally the conclusion. Okay. So first if we see the context. So last year on November 15, 2021, our Prime Minister Narendra Modi has inaugurated a railway station in that is Rani Kamalapati, formerly Habib Ganj railway station in Bhopal. And this is the first ever model station that was constructed in the country using the PPP model, okay? That is using the private partnership. And who is this Rani Kamalapati? She was a gold queen, okay? So that is some extra context here. So if you can write this context in the introduction only, okay, that will, that is going to give you very good marks, okay? And now let us look at what we can write. So these are some of the pictures of that event. So from which part of the syllabus this question was asked if you see? Infrastructure, energy, ports, roads, airports, railways and investment models, okay? Both these parts combined a question was asked, okay? So if you understand all the questions that are asked in UPSC mains generally, they won't go out of syllabus, but there can be clubbing of two parts of the syllabus and giving a question, okay? That is what happened here. Now let us look at the parts of the question, deconstructing the question. In the introduction, as I have already told you what you can write, context, which we have already discussed. After that, you can just give one line definition of what is a PPP model. So PPP is an arrangement between government and private sector for the provision of public assets and or public services. So if you can just give two lines definition of what is a PPP model, that will be sufficient. First context around three lines, after that two lines, what is the definition, okay? That will be a very good introduction. After that, we have two parts of the question. What is the need of PPP model for infrastructure as a whole? Later, role of PPP in the redevelopment of railway stations in India. Okay. So these are the two parts of the question. First, let us look at the first part. So what is the need of PPP model in the infrastructure sector in India? So why do we need private sector partnership? Obviously, we know that government, that is the public sector has very limited resources. So, and infrastructure require a lot of resources. In the national infrastructure pipeline also, we have seen that around 111 lakh crores is required. And government can't spend all that money by itself. So obviously, to mobilize some resources from the private sector, we require public-private partnership. Okay, now let us look at why we need PPP in the infrastructure projects. Huge investment on government shall be reduced, just like I have told you now. And faster completion of projects. We know that private sector completes the project at a faster manner and more efficient manner also. Okay, so some targets can be given for the private sector. Similarly, take a role of facilitator than being a constructor. Here the facilitator role has to be borne by the 
government instead of being a constructor if it can act as a facilitator that will be more helpful similarly managerial issues in the public sector we know that private sector manages a project much better than the public sector okay so that is one aspect and low efficiency within the public sector i already told you private sector completes a project in a more efficient manner and in a more timely manner okay similarly globalization with globalization more and more technology transfers more and more financial resources like fdi fpi all these can be better used by a private sector than public sector okay and similarly new dynamics in the world capital market like masala bonds and all and they can be accessed by private sector that is one advantage with respect to private sector and rate on investment is higher in ppp and reduces corruption and spillage of funds and provides expertise both in skills and construction we know that private sector has better skills and better technologies with respect to the construction of these projects so that is going to help and similarly if you see role of ppp in the redevelopment of railway stations now we have seen overall in the infrastructure sector what is the role of private sector now why do we need private sector for the redevelopment of railways obviously railway stations we know that currently in india they are in a very bad state okay no neatness and they are not used properly also so to use these railway stations in a better manner and to monetize some of the assets that are there with respect to the railways if private sector is involved that is going to boost the railway sector by a lot okay so let us see so improve the conditions of railway stations as i have already told you the conditions of railway stations in india are very poor and provide better facilities to the passengers and logistic services so if private sector gets involved it will provide even better services because their motive will be profit and if they provide better facilities better profits okay so more efficiency also will be there and generate more revenue for the indian railways by monetizing these assets and by transferring these assets to the private sector more revenue can also be generated that is not happening right now okay and reduce the burden on the government for construction of the infrastructure as I, we have already discussed there won't be too much burden on the government with respect to this construction of infrastructure and enhance the efficiency of indian railways through use of advanced state of art technologies we have already seen that state of art technologies or advanced technologies are available with private sector when compared to public sector so they can be utilized and construction of shopping and other miscellaneous services within the stations so this is nothing but monetization of asset that is present in the railway station that is going to again generate extra revenue okay and next if you see some more aspects clean environment within the we know that railway station not clean environment not very good drinking water okay all these facilities if they are redeveloped in a very good manner that is going to help and we know that in general delhi metro is one of the cleanest metros and why is that so because it is not directly managed by the government okay it is managed by one organization that is set up and because whenever a railway station looks world class infra with world class infrastructure even people will think again by corrupting that environment okay so that is going to help and it can enhance the safety and security of passengers women and children with the use of advanced facilities some advanced facilities can be provided which will also boost the security infrastructure and it can reduce the maintenance cost of the stations in the long term because they will be maintained by the private sectors government burden will reduce okay and finally we can conclude by saying that vivek debroy committee they have also suggested that to mobilize resources for the indian railways and favor the privatization of the rolling stock so even they have suggested a little bit of privatization is needed with respect to railway sector and by using all these things and by improving better infrastructure using the ppp model our aim of achieving 5 trillion economy can be achieved okay by giving such a conclusion you can conclude your question in a very better manner so as we have already discussed the first question now let us move on to the second question so what is the second question so is inclusive growth possible under market economy and state the significance of financial inclusion in achieving economic growth in india so here we have three main terms what are those 
ఫస్ట్ ఈజ్ ఇన్క్లూజివ్ గ్రోత్ సో వీ షుడ్ నో వాట్ ఈస్ ఇన్క్లూజివ్ గ్రోత్ ఆఫ్టర్ దట్ మార్కెట్ ఎకానమీ సో వీ నీడ్ టు నో వాట్ ఈస్ మార్కెట్ ఎకానమీ అండ్ దెన్ వన్ మోర్ థింగ్ ఫైనాన్షియల్ ఇన్క్లూషన్ so if we know all these three things then it will be very easy to answer this question so first part of the question is is inclusive growth possible in a market economy now what is a market economy market economy is nothing but demand and supply factors if they are dominating in a market that is what is a market economy and what is inclusive growth so in the introduction you can write that definition of inclusive growth so it is the economic growth that is distributed fairly across society and creates equal opportunities for all so inclusive growth is nothing but it should be equal it should create equal opportunities for all and the benefit out of it also should be distributed to everyone equally and market economy as i have told it is based on demand and supply now in a market economy is it possible to have inclusive growth that is what is the question we can say it is possible to some extent but it is not possible to some extent also so we are going to see both the aspects whether it is possible or not possible so if you see inclusive growth possible how is it possible because in a market economy more and more new opportunities will be created with new opportunities more jobs will be created inclusive growth is nothing but participative means everybody has to participate in the process of growth so with more creation of jobs more employment more participation can happen so that is one aspect and fdi inflow can also happen in a market economy obviously when we are going to allow private investment so fdi inflows will flow into our country and again that will create more job opportunities more investment more job opportunities and similarly innovation and entrepreneurship okay so with the introduction of fdi private sector all these things in a market economy more innovation and more entrepreneurship will happen because in a market economy obviously we know that private sector is going to dominate instead of public sector okay and trickle down effect A trickle down effect is nothing but so at the top if you are going to develop the benefits will flow down slowly okay so in a market economy trickle down effect will be caused so just like what is happening in countries like us and all their market economy is dominant so because everybody is developing on their own it will be trickling down to the lower sections of the society also and creates social capital okay so from these aspects we can say that inclusive growth is possible and what are the points from which we can say it is not possible we will see so if you see inequalities in the economy will increase why inequalities in will increase because in a market economy everybody will be profit motivated so when everybody is profit motivated and if we leave everything to the market economy without any government regulation people will increase their profits more okay only the rich people will be becoming more richer and because market generally doesn't care about social justice poverty all these aspects the poverty will remain the same the trickling down effect it will take a lot of time so that's why inequalities will increase especially the economic inequalities and increase in unemployment because so fdi inflows all these things can happen but in a country like what is happening with india if there are unskilled labor whatever the fdi inflows that are happening and whatever the investments that are happening they may be capital intensive instead of labor intensive okay that will create more and more unemployment instead of employment okay that can be one negative aspect and it may lead to poor and unhygienic working conditions because there can be exploitation in a market economy that is from where the karl marx philosophy came so he is against the capitalism so capitalism is where market economy comes into picture so more and more exploitation can be there and may affect the equitable resource allocation because in a market market cannot do the purpose of social justice okay they cannot distribute the resources equally only government can do such things fine and last markets cannot ensure social justice as i have already telling social justice with respect to poverty alleviation or increasing the health benefits okay all these things cannot be done in a market economy normally if government hospitals are not there in india 
the health indicators will be even down. If you leave everything for the market, that is everything for the private sector, only private hospitals are existing in the country, then what will happen? The health indicators will fall down drastically. Okay, so social justice cannot be created in a market economy. Okay, so that is one aspect. And next, if you see, markets cannot resolve the macroeconomic problems of the country like long term economic growth. Normally, even during the pandemic time, we have observed that even though the country's GDP is coming down, even though the country's GDP is having negative growth rate, so many companies' stocks have risen. So from that, what we can understand, markets definitely they can contribute to the national GDP, but they can't resolve the macroeconomic problems like long-term economic growth or poverty alleviation or inflation control. All of these things are out of the scope of market. So there definitely government intervention has to be there. Okay? So these are the points regarding whether it is possible or not possible. Okay? So next, significance of financial inclusion in achieving economic growth in India. So financial inclusion is like getting the financial services to even the lower sections of the society. Everybody should have access to the financial resources. Financial resources like banking services and not only banking services, all types of financial services like be it insurance, pensions, okay, direct benefit transfer, everything comes under financial services. So if these financial services are available to even the lower sections or marginalized sections of society, then only we can say there is financial inclusion in a country. Now, what is the significance of this financial inclusion in achieving economic growth? So, savings of the poor can be mobilized. So normally poor people, they don't store their money in bank accounts because there are no facilities available. So if we can provide financial services even at the village level, even at the rural level, then their resources can be mobilized and using which more investments can happen. And similarly, micro credit increases the scope of self-employment. So not only the deposit, if you can provide them with micro credit, just by having a micro credit of 50,000 and by establishing a small tiffin center, a person's life can be set. Okay, so micro credit, if we make it available, self-employment is going to increase. Okay, so that is one aspect. And micro insurance, poor people like to have property, ill health, etc. So micro insurance schemes, what will they do? They will help the people to have insurance against their property, health, all these aspects. So that people don't spend too much amount of money on health aspects and all. Okay, and micro pension, it will create financial security for the old age people, for the vulnerable people, for the disabled people, okay, micro pension. And similarly, promotes women empowerment through small help groups. So small help groups is one of the major aspect when it comes to financial inclusion. You might have heard about Dwakra, okay, and enables implementation of DBT. Now today, most of the government schemes are being disbursed using direct benefit transfer. If that has to be successful, definitely financial inclusion has to be there. And government, we already know, for financial inclusion is implementing one thing called jam printing. Okay, Jandan accounts, Aadhaar and mobile. Okay, that is one of the very important aspect regarding financial inclusion. And at last, service delivery can be there. So when all these things happen only, there can be economic growth in a country. Okay? So with self-employment and all, more and more economic resources will be generated, then only more production will happen and then only economic growth can be there. Okay? Unless the lower section of the society develops, there cannot be economic growth. And finally, these are some of the schemes related to financial inclusion that are there in our country. Like Pradhan Mantri, Jandan Yojana, already I have told you, Jam Trinity. Okay, you can mention just one or two schemes regarding the financial inclusion. And you can say that government is implementing some of these schemes for financial inclusion. And in the conclusion also, you can mention one of them, one or two of them. And your conclusion, you can write in an optimistic manner. You can start by saying that our Oxfam report is telling that there are growing inequalities. 
and government through implementing these financial inclusion schemes is actually trying to have a better financial inclusion okay so a optimistic conclusion and you can say that environmental impact and role of government and inclusive growth with respect to inclusive growth the sdg goal that is given by united nations that also you can mention while writing the conclusion so that will be a better conclusion for this question let us move on to the third question now let's see what is the question so what are the major challenges of public distribution system in india and how can it be made effective and transparent so here we have two parts of the question in the first part of the question they are asking that what are the major challenges in the public distribution system so first we need to understand what is public distribution system and what are the challenges that public distribution system is facing later we need to say how can it be made effective and transparent okay how these challenges can be overcome how can it be made more effective and transparent okay so let us see so first what is public distribution system we all know that public distribution system is nothing but a system for management of scarcity and distribution of food grains at affordable prices what we call as ration okay at affordable prices whatever the food grains we are going to supply for the people the system that is happening there we call it public distribution system and within time pdf has become very important in the food economy of india okay pds has become as much important as it is actually managing the demand and supply of the food grains in india so and also it is important even for the nutritional purposes okay without pds system the nutritional levels of india can come down drastically and one more aspect but there are some challenges with respect to this pds system that needs to be mentioned okay and those challenges need to be overcome how we can overcome these challenges and what are the challenges we will see so first challenges being faced by pds system in india so what are these challenges first storage issues we know that fci is the organization food corporation of india is the organization which procures the food grains from the states or from the farmers so fci doesn't have proper storage facilities now whatever the storage facilities that are there there the management of these storage facilities is also in a very unscientific manner because of these problems there is a lot of wastage also okay in a country like india we can't afford wastages and because of lack of storage facilities this is happening and procurement issues now fci is the organization that is procuring all the food grains that are required for the pds system and it doesn't have the required resources to do these operations so many committees have suggested that fci should outsource its activities procurement activities to the state government okay and similarly transportation and logistic issues okay transportation and logistic issues are faced by not only fci in general in the farming sector okay in the agriculture sector it is one of the major issue that is being faced and leakages these leakages not only at the top level at the lower level also at the top level the leakages happen with respect to the officials at the lower level at the fair price shops what we call as ration shops there also leakages are happening that is also an issue and similarly corruption in the pds system I already told you a lot of corruption happens at the fair price level and similarly at the higher levels also and ghost beneficiaries who are these ghost beneficiaries fake ration cards duplicate cards okay so by giving benefits benefits to these kind of beneficiaries there is a lot of wastage of resources okay and one more thing huge subsidy burden on the government by providing this pds huge subsidy burden is happening on the government so that is also one of the challenge so how to overcome this huge subsidy burden so one aspect that government is doing is introducing dbt direct benefit transfer and computerization of all the aspects of pds system so we will see what are the things that are happening so measures to make pds effective and transparent so first measure end to end computerization of the whole supply chain and when we do that obviously what will happen the leakages the corruption all these aspects will reduce 
Now, what are some of the measures taken by the government with respect to this aspect? If you see, integrated management of PDS, IMPDS, and it is being developed for the one nation, one ration card system. Okay. And similarly, online depot management of the whole PDS system and automation of FPS. FPS means fair price shops, what we call as ration shops. And their government has introduced one method called BAPU, Biometric Authenticated Fiscal Uptake. So here what will happen when you give your biometric, they, it has to be linked with the weight mission. On the weight mission, what are the food grains and how much our cases that need to be dispersed, that will be linked to a machine. And there, when you give your biometric only, it will generate the slip. Okay? So, biometric authenticated physical uptake. Okay? That is being implemented in most of the South Indian states. Especially in Andhra Pradesh, it has become very successful. And one more aspect, linking Aadhaar with the ration card. Okay? So, these are some of the reforms that government has done recently. And we know that PDS system, it is mainly maintained by state governments. So, majority of the reforms, they have to be taken up by the state governments. And next, full transparency of records, that is list of beneficiaries to be made public. So, when we are going to make the list of beneficiaries public, what will happen? If there is any exclusion error or inclusion error, that can be overcome. Exclusion error is like some of the people that have to be included are being excluded. Inclusion error, that means some beneficiaries who should not get the benefit are being included. Okay? Such things can be overcome when we make the beneficiaries list public. And one more thing, decentralization of the procurement operations. I already told you, FCI doesn't have enough facilities for procuring. So, FCI has to decentralize its procurement operations, especially to the state governments. Okay? And doorstep delivery of food grains, that is happening in states like Andhra Pradesh. So, this is also one thing that can be done. And diversification of commodities under the PDS. Not only food grains, along with food grains, we need to provide some more extra items through the PDS system, so that there will be better management, okay? better nutritional levels also. And grievance redressal office to be appointed at the district level. So that whenever there is any problem, whenever there is any grievance, it should be solved at the lowest level possible. Okay? So these are some of the aspects that can be implemented. And in the conclusion, you can write PDS reforms and the Chhattisgarh model. So in Chhattisgarh model, what happened? In three phases, they have developed the PDS system in such a way that it is being appreciated by the central government and also by the Supreme Court also. Okay? So by quoting the Chhattisgarh model, you can conclude your answer. That will be a very good conclusion. Okay? Let us move on to the next question. So, Elaborate the scope and significance of the food processing industry in India. So here first we need to know what is food processing and what is food processing industry. So that we can write about the scope and significance. These are the two parts of the question, scope and significance. So first let us look at what is food processing and what is a food processing industry. So food processing, in the introduction you can explain what is food processing industry or in general what is food processing. So food processing is a process under which any raw product of agriculture, okay, whatever the raw product of agriculture is there, that what we are doing or dairy or animal husbandry, meat, poultry or fishing. Generally we think that food processing is just related to food grains, no. So along with food grains, even the dairy products, animal husbandry, meat, poultry or fishing, all of them come under the category of food processing. Okay, is transformed. Okay, and how is it transformed? By, in, by involving some employees, power, machines or some money. That is original physical properties undergo a change. So that whatever the raw material is there, that will undergo its physical properties and it will transform into a product. By involving some employees, by involving some machinery, all these aspects. This is what is a food processing industry. Okay? And a transformed product has the commercial value and it is suitable for human and animal consumption. Now, whatever the transformed product is there, that should be able to be consumed by not only humans, even animal consumption also. Okay? So, these we call as a food processing industries. Next, 
Now, what is the scope of food processing industry in India? So, recently, as a measure to boost the SPA, as I have already told you, if you can give the context why this question was asked in the exam, that is going to fetch you some extra marks. So, as a measure to boost FPI, food processing industry, government recently launched Food Processing Week 2.0 to emphasize on the potential of FPI in India. Now, what is the scope of food processing industry in India? What are the factors that are helping with respect to the development of food processing industry? Now, geographical factors. India is a country which is blessed with very good amount of raw materials. So, India is a country which has flourishing agriculture sector. So, the raw material availability is very high because of our geographical factors. India is a country with one of the highest rainfall and also one of the highest area of cultivable land, okay, even more than some of the largest countries, okay. So, geographical factors, that is one thing and these geographical factors will help in raw material, okay. And similarly, food and grocery market. India has one of the largest food and grocery market in the world. So, the food processing industry, whatever the products that are made by using the food processing industry, they will have a huge market in India itself. So, in India itself, we have a huge market. Similarly, demographic dividend of India. Food processing industry is an industry which is more labor intensive. So, a labor intensive industry requires more and more people to get employed. So, India is blessed with one of the largest demographic dividend in the world. Okay, where the employable population is very high. Okay, and foreign demand for the Indian products. The demand for the Indian products is not only there in India, in other countries like UAE, UAE and the Gulf countries imports largest number of Indian food products. Okay, there is a lot of demand for Indian products even in the foreign countries also. And one more aspect, policy measures like export processing zones. Okay, all these factors are helping the food processing industry to grow in India. So, there is a lot of scope that is being created for food processing industry in India. Now, let us look at the significance of food processing industry. So, that is the scope. Now, what is the significance or importance? When we look at the compound annual growth rate, it is 10 percent. It is one of the highest with respect to any sector in India. And that's why we call food processing industry as a sunrise sector, sunrise industry. Okay. So, sunrise industry or sunrise sector is nothing but it has very high potential to grow. So, that is being evident from the compound annual growth rate which is 10 percent. And it also creates a lot of employment. Currently, it is around 1.7 million and within few years, it is going to cross even 10 million, okay. That much potential is there with respect to food processing industry. And the goal of doubling farmer's income. So, with whatever our goal is there with respect to doubling the farmer income, one of the very important aspect there has to be food processing industry. Because whatever the raw material that is there, farmers will get very less amount for that. But if they can be converted into some product by using food processing industries, okay, by making that food processing, then it is going to improve their income, okay. And augments manufacturing industry. So, whatever the manufacturing industry is there, that is already present in India, it can augment that or supplement that. It can be an addition to that. And similarly, enhances nutrition of the nation. So, with respect to the nutrition also, if the nutrition levels of the country has to be improved, the processed foods are one of the major aspect regarding that, okay. We can do biofortification or food fortification using these techniques for the processed foods, we can improve the nutrition levels of the country also. And bar on the migration. Now, if more and more employment gets created, migration from rural areas to urban areas can decrease. Similarly, migration from India to other countries also can be reduced, okay. And one last, improves food intake and reduces the food wastage, okay. By doing food processing, a large amount of food wastages can be reduced. And also the food intake, better food intake also will increase. Better products will be available, diversified products will be available. And some more points, 
it boosts the overall trade of the economy okay with respect to agriculture products the overall trade of the economy will increase and when our exports increase automatically it will improve our current account deficit okay which is one of the major concern for india and it checks the food inflation it will stop the food prices by increasing a large level and improves the diet culture that is it is the recent trend in india diet culture everybody is now moving towards following a proper diet so it will help in the diet culture that is there presently in india and finally you can conclude by writing a way forward how all these things can be done okay development of a dedicated corridor for food processing industry in india just like industrial corridors similarly bringing more and more fdi into the food processing industry similarly enhancing storage facilities like cold storage facilities unless we have storage facilities like cold storage facilities the food that the raw material that is available in india cannot be used for processing and one last aspect labeling of the products so that they can be used or they can be made export friendly so if we have to export food items they need to be labeled properly then only other countries are going to accept these things so by writing all these aspects you can conclude your answer in a proper manner okay let us move on to the next question so the next question is economic growth in the recent past has been led by increase in labor productivity so here they are telling that in the recent past our economic growth which is very high is led by labor productivity so we need to understand what is labor productivity and how is it related to the economic growth and the next part is explain this statement so first we need to explain this statement after that suggest the growth pattern that will lead to creation of more jobs without compromising the labor productivity so in this question it is being asked that we have to suggest one alternative model such that without compromising the labor productivity our economic growth should be even higher okay so first we are going to look at what is labor productivity what is the meaning of labor productivity and how is it related to economic growth later we will see what type of growth model we can suggest so that the labor productivity will not increase and remember this labor productivity is closely related to the concept of human capital formation or human resource development in our ncert class 11 indian economic development we have a separate chapter dedicated to this human capital formation so if you have read that chapter some of the aspects that we are going to discuss with respect to this question are almost similar so first what is labor productivity so labor productivity is, is the increase in output okay increase in the output or value added for the labor hour that means whatever the labor hour whatever the energy put by labor in one hour and how much output or value added has happened that is what is labor productivity so in other words it is like it measures the real gdp produced in an hour through labor that means whatever a labor has produced extra gdp okay extra real gdp in an hour is what we are calling as labor productivity now it is an important economic indicator closely linked with economic growth and living standards of the people so this labor productivity is closely linked with economic growth why because it is related to real gdp and we know that real gdp is one of the indicator of economic growth increase in real gdp is what we call as economic growth so because labor productivity is directly correlated with economic growth so it is also related to the economic growth with increase in labor productivity obviously there will be increase in economic growth also and as per the india ratings and research report okay it is a re recent report india's labor productivity is averaging at 5.24% and with a record of 7.6% in the year of 2016 and this increased labor productivity has resulted in the increased economic growth in the country so currently our labor productivity is averaging at a high rate okay but one aspect is even if we want to sustain a economic growth of around 8% and more and if we want to achieve the 5 trillion dollar economy our labor productivity has to be even higher so now for achieving that 5 trillion dollar economy we need a sustainable growth model 
okay and that sustainable growth model whatever we are going to adopt it should not decrease the labor productivity okay now if you see what are the factors responsible for increase in this labor productivity in the recent times so the first aspect is government's initiatives like pradhan mantri kaushal vikas yojana alage similarly skill india program okay pradhan mantri kaushal vikas yojana skill india program these are some of the programs initiated by the government for upskilling of the labor as i have already told you human capital formation is closely related with labor productivity so if we want to increase the labor productivity obviously the skill level of the people should be higher okay government is adopt and it has even created a separate ministry for skill development fine and increasing the savings private capital and foreign investment so with more and more increasing the savings of the people the investment also will increase it will create more credit formation with the creation of more credit more investment will happen and similarly foreign investments also being attracted towards india okay that is also helping in increasing the labor productivity overall and technological advancements are also helping in the overall increase in labor productivity not only see for increasing labor productivity there should be human capital formation with the technological advancements the health levels the educational levels all these aspects are also improving contributing to more labor productivity and with the infrastructure development okay with the infrastructure development overall the quality of life of people has increased and when there is increase in quality of life of people obviously it will correlate to the increase in labor productivity of the people and huge investment inflows in the r&d sector okay so all these factors have contributed to increase in the labor productivity now as asked in the question we should suggest a growth model or a growth pattern such that without decreasing labor productivity there should be high economic growth now sir normally if we focus too much on technology advancements what will happen it may lead to automation and capital intensive investment and that might lead to unemployment so which is not sustainable even though there can be economic growth with that with such kind of model but there can be unemployment which is not a sustainable model so we should suggest a balanced model now how this balanced model should be and what are the aspects that needs to be in this balanced model we will see so first strengthening of msmes now why msmes has to be strengthened because msmes are a sector which are more labor intensive so when we strengthen msmes obviously we are going to increase the labor productivity because they are the labor intensive sector and lagged labor productive sectors like construction agriculture mining should be given more priority along with them other labor intensive industries like leather industries okay all these things have to be improved and similarly reforms in the agriculture sector has to happen and why this has to happen because we know that in agriculture sector there is disguised unemployment and disguised unemployment directly correlates to the decrease in the labor productivity okay so that's why agriculture sector has to be improved in such a manner there is there should be more economic growth and it should contribute more to the economic growth and exploration and development of more sunrise sectors i already told you one example of sunrise sector is food processing industry so such sectors needs to be developed more okay so then only there will be a sustainable economic growth and one more thing encouraging startup culture okay when we encourage more and more startup culture there will be more and more employment that will be created and it will contribute to more generation of national income and increase in real per capita income directly correlates to the economic growth and upskilling and reskilling of the labor so upskilling is like imparting the skills reskilling is like upgradation of the skills so unless there is upgradation of the skills over a period of time the skills will be outdated and it will again decrease the labor productivity and attract more private capital and foreign investment so that there will be more jobs created and it will contribute to our economic growth in the form of more investment and increase in the investment on r and d and human capital 
as i have already told you human capital is directly related to economic growth so we need to increase the facilities of education infrastructure similarly health facilities all these only when all these facilities improves then only it will be a sustainable economic model without compromising the labor productivity okay now in the conclusion what you can write as i have already told you in the starting india will have to raise its labor productivity growth to 6.3% to achieve 8% gdp growth unless that happens we cannot sustain our high growth rate and we can't achieve our 5 trillion dollar economic goal and one last thing to achieve the export target set by the foreign trade policy our foreign trade policy has set some targets even to achieve such a targets we need to adopt the model that we have suggested okay so that is with respect to this question okay let us move on to the next question that was asked so the question is do you think india will meet the 50% of its energy needs from renewable energy by 2030 so we have kept a target of 50% of energy need we have to meet by renewable energy by 2030 and we will see where we have given this target okay and all what is the context of this question first we will see and the second part justify your answer and how will the shift of subsidies from fossil fuel to renewable help us to achieve the above objective okay we have to explain that so if there is a shift of subsidies which are now been given to the fossil fuel if there is a shift to renewable energy then can it help to meet this requirement okay that is the crux of the question now what is the context let us see so in the introduction as i have already told you if you can give the context of the question that will be added advantage so our prime minister narendra modi okay when he went to the unf triple c conference cop 26 that has happened in glasgow he has mentioned a word called panchamrit okay so as part of this india targeted to achieve 50 percent of its power from renewable sources by 2030 currently how much it is it is around 28 percent so from 28 percent to 50 percent increase which is not a small increase it has to be drastic increase okay so can we achieve this or not we will see so in order to achieve the set target there is a dire need of shifting subsidies so in the introduction only you have to use the question okay so there is a dire need of shifting the subsidies from non-fossil fuel to the non-fossil fuel subsidies that is renewable energy from the fossil fuel subsidies now what is the installed generation capacity fuel wise okay if you see fossil fuel how much total 58.5 percent and it is dominated by obviously coal almost around 50 percent okay so non-fossil fuel or renewable energy sources including the hydropower if you see it is around 39.7 percent and always remember small hydropower generally we consider it under renewable energy but not large hydropower but including large hydropower also it is around 40 percent so hydropower it is around overall 11.6 percent so always remember small hydropower is part of renewable energy but hydro large hydropower generally we don't consider it under renewable energy now if you look at overall renewable energy okay so wind solar and other renewable energy as i have already told you currently it is around 28.3 percent and out of that wind energy around 10 percent solar 14.3 and the rest of them very less okay bio power around 2.5 waste to energy 0.1 small hydro even less and here we have very high potential okay that we are not harnessing yet small hydro power in india we have very large potential we are only focusing on large hydro power instead of that we should focus more on small hydro power and nuclear around 1.7 percent and total non-fossil fuel 41.5 percent overall 100 percent okay that 58 percent fossil fuel power generation this 41.5 percent and in that renewable form of energy 28.3 okay now can india achieve 50 percent of renewable energy by 2030 
So this we are going to explain using one report. What is that report? International Institute for Sustainable Development has given one report. And in that report, what they have done? Mapping of India's energy subsidies 2021 and time for renewed support to the clean energy. So based on this report, we can say this question was asked. Okay, whatever the findings that are there in this report, we can directly use them for answering the question. So in this question, they are asking that whether if there is a shift from fossil fuel subsidies to non-fossil fuel subsidies, can there be increase in the renewable energy percentage in India? Can we achieve the target of 50%? So in this, they have also discussed that government of India used the subsidies, okay? to support the various energy sectors in India and now currently we have increased the target of achieving 1.5 gigawatts by 2022 that is the renewable energy target and we have increased it to 450 gigawatts by 2030 almost more than double okay so from the target of 175 gigawatts 2022 to now we have directly increased the target to 450 by 2030 okay now whatever the subsidies that are there if there is a shift can it be helpful so in this report they have discussed that and the shift in energy subsidies due to the covid 19 so they have also discussed how there is a shift in the subsidies after covid 19 okay now the findings of this report so subsidies to electricity transmission and distribution is around 1.3 lakh crores and out of that oil and gas subsidies are around 55,000 crores, EV subsidies are around 1,120 crores and fossil fuels obviously they continue to get most of the subsidies given by the government, okay. So how, there, how if there is a shift and not only apart from that there is ined, apart from the inadequate subsidies there are also other limitations which are hampering us to achieve the target of 50 percent by 2030. Okay, one thing obviously subsidies is one factor because in the question that is asked we are going to discuss it a little bit detail and apart from subsidies there are some other factors which are hampering the growth of the renewable energy sector. Let us see what are those. So the first one lack of technology. So with respect to the renewable energy India is lacking the technology that is required for establishing the power plants. For example, solar panels, okay, all those things we are importing from other countries. So we lack the technology. So that is one limitation. And similarly, failure of promise of developed countries under Paris Agreement. So under Paris Agreement, developed countries have promised that they will do technology transfer. But they are failing in doing such things, okay. And similarly, excessive dependence on coal. We have already seen that even today. 50% of our energy requirements are met by coal. So excessive dependence on that, okay, thermal power plants. And resources mobilization, solar batteries, wind power equipment. So there is a dire need of resource mobilization. In India, the solar panels and the wind power equipment are in very short supply. Okay, we are importing them, okay. The local manufacturing has to improve by a lot. Okay, unless it happens, we can't have a sustainable model of renewable energy development. And one more thing, lack of recycling mechanisms that are present in the India. So these are also some of the other factors that are hampering as achieving that 50% target of renewable energy. And if you look at, so shift of subsidies from fossil fuels to renewable energy, can it play a catalytic role? Yes, of course it can play. Now, how can we say it can play a catalytic role? We will see some points. So, if we reduce the subsidies to the fossil fuel, then what will happen? Automatically, the tariff rates for the fossil fuel energy will increase. Now, then there can be a shift to the non-renewable energy and we can shift those subsidies to the renewable energy. The tariffs here will decrease. So when there is decrease in tariff of renewable energy and increase in tariff of fossil fuel energy, automatically people will slowly start shifting towards renewable form of energy. Even the industries will start shifting towards renewable form of energy, which will give more boost to the renewable form of energy. Not only that, the technology that is required, okay, new technology to harness the renewable power. So when we give more and more subsidies, more and more technologies also can be developed. 
okay with the development of new technologies whatever the limitations that are there lack of technology which we have discussed okay that can be overcome and the subsidies attract investment when there are subsidies automatically there will be more and more investment especially the fda and one example we can see with respect to the automobile sector and all recently because government is giving some kind of subsidies manufacturing sector especially okay there is increase in the investment in those sectors and encourages industries to choose their energy needs from the renewable energy so obviously when tariff decrease even the industries will now prefer having renewable form of energy okay so these are some of the aspects we can say and finally we can conclude that the shift of subsidies to fund clean energy is the need of the hour because whatever the money that is given in the form of subsidies is our money okay the people money the people's money has government has to spend in a productive manner that is by giving them to the cleaner fuels instead of again giving it to the fossil fuels by writing such a statement you can conclude your answer that will be a good conclusion okay okay let us discuss one last question with respect to the economy so what are the main bottlenecks in the upstream and downstream process of marketing of agriculture okay products in india so here we need to understand what is agriculture marketing similarly what is the upstream process what is the downstream process and what are the problems associated with it and how we can overcome these problems because this is a 15 mark question we have to also give the solutions also if it is a 10 mark question directly we can write the problems and we can conclude it okay in the conclusion only we can write way forward but because this is a 15 mark question we have to also provide the solutions also then we have to conclude okay so first we will see so normally marketing of agriculture products or agriculture marketing is very important part okay in the whole process of agriculture sector okay unless agriculture marketing happens in a proper manner the income of the farmers will not be more and similarly the food processing industry will not work properly but there are several impediments that are happening in this process of agriculture marketing both in the upstream stage and downstream stage so in this question we are going to see what are the bottlenecks in the upstream stage what are the bottlenecks in the downstream stage that are actually hampering the growth of agriculture marketing and because agriculture marketing is overall important for the agriculture sector we have to look at these things so first we need to understand what is this upstream stage and what is this downstream stage so first upstream process refers to the material inputs needed for the production so it is totally related to the procurement of raw materials okay procurement of raw materials and these raw materials will be procured it involves accessibility of raw materials storage facilities for the raw material and transport facilities so it is totally related to gathering the raw materials accessing them gathering them transporting them to the industry okay till the level of raw material that is what we call a upstream shape after that start the downstream stage where we have to process these raw materials then we have to distribute them and then the distribution process we will have wholesale retail and finally to the consumers okay this all process we call it downstream stage so there will be some bottlenecks in the upstream stage and there will be some bottlenecks in the downstream stage also now what are the bottlenecks in the upstream stage of the agriculture marketing so the first and foremost problem is lack of storage facilities so if we don't have proper storage facilities like cold storages warehouses etc what will happen farmers have to buy their produce at a early date that will be one thing and similarly there can be more and more wastages also and because farmers have to sell their produce at a early date they might not be getting the better price so just understand if we have better storage facilities obviously farmers can wait till a date there will be a better price in the market and then they can sell now because of lack of storage facilities they are forced to sell their produce at a early date okay and inadequate transportation facilities because of inadequate transportation facilities again there is a lot of wastage that is happening okay and there is a lot of extra cost that is involved in the process and middlemen so the problem of middlemen is very huge especially in the apmcs and all okay in the mandis 
So these middlemen, they take a lot of profit, okay, without giving it to the actual farmers. And now because of lack of transport facilities, farmers are not able to transport their produce to the actual markets. So they are selling it to middlemen. They are taking all the profits. They are getting benefit of the market mechanism, okay, increase or decrease in the prices. Now unregulated local markets, so some of the local markets are unregulated which is leading to a lot of malpractices also. So malpractices also happen in the markets. And similarly lack of institutional credit facilities. Now why institutional credit facilities are required? So just understand, if there are no proper institutional credit facilities, farmers have to take loans from money lenders who charge humongous amounts of interest rates. Now if they are going to take humongous amount of interest rate from the credit from the so instead of institutional facilities, if they take credit from the money lenders and when they are going to charge high interest rate, so what will happen? Again, they will be forced to sell their produce at early date because their interest rates are very high. They can't afford to sell their produce at a later date. So if they avail the institutional credit facilities, then there they can get at a low interest rate, then they can sell their produce at a date where they get the best price, okay? That is one aspect. And lack of grading and standardization facilities. Because of lack of these facilities, farmers may not be getting the actual amount they should get for the quality of their produce, okay? So these are some of the bottlenecks in the upstream stage. Bottlenecks in the downstream stage are like, low market intelligence. So what is this market in intelligence? So the market, how the prices in the market are going to be shifted over a period of time. Unless we predict that, we can't wait for some time. So tomorrow if we know that the prices may increase, we can wait for tomorrow and we can sell the produce tomorrow. So that's why market intelligence is required. And the government is also trying to create one market intelligence system, and but it is being lagged, okay? So it has to be implemented as fast as possible. And similarly, logistical issues on the distribution side. In India, one of the major issue is the logistics. Even in the logistics performance index of the World Bank, we are lagging behind a lot, okay? So, and high levels of competition in the market. Okay, because of this high level of competition, again there will be some problems that can arise. And this high level of competition we can reduce by promoting more and more exports. Okay, that is not happening. And one more thing, inadequate brand value. So unless there is a brand value that is created, there cannot be any exports. And similarly, even though the local level products, even they may be of very high quality, because of lack of brand value, they are not getting promoted. Their products are not getting promoted, okay? And they are not being marketed properly. So these are the bottlenecks in the downstream stage. And what are the measures that can be taken to overcome the problems? So first aspect, market regulation through APMC Acts, okay? So that there will not be any malpractices and the problem of middlemen, all these things can be regulated. And branding and labeling, as I have already told you, without branding and labeling, a product cannot be sold in the other countries, okay? So for exporting our products, we need branding and labeling, not only other countries, even in other states and all, to diversify the market, we need branding and labeling. And reducing the influence of middlemen. Okay, by adopting alternative market mechanisms. Now, what are these alternative market mechanisms? One example is Rai to Bazaar concept in Andhra Pradesh. So in a Rai to Bazaar, what will happen? Farmers can directly sell their produce to the consumers. No issue of middlemen. Okay, and similar models are also adopted in other states. Ujavar Sandis in Tamil Nadu. Okay, so these are some of the mechanisms that can be adopted and improving infrastructure facilities. So what type of infrastructure facilities? Warehouses, cold storages, overall the infrastructure facilities, even the weight missions. So according to some survey, majority of the, okay, more than 50% of the APMCs in India or Mandis in India doesn't even have weighing facilities, which is a very poor state, okay? And improving the transport facilities. We have already seen how the transport facilities can help in marketing. Let us say the places that are in the outside of Delhi, 
they can easily access the very large markets in Delhi because of transport facilities. So when there are better transport facilities, farmers can access better markets, okay? And market information can be disseminated, okay? Through newspaper or radio or news channels, etc. So that farmers will know exactly what are the prices that are there in the market and the middlemen cannot exploit them. Okay, so that is one aspect and finally we can conclude by saying marketing has a huge potential in improving the agriculture's contribution to our GDP and unless we improve the overall marketing environment in the country, the doubling of farmers income cannot happen. Okay, with this we can conclude, okay, that will be a better conclusion.